More often than not, we've been discussing functions that are defined on open subsets of Rn. But sometimes we want to look at functions that are not just defined on open subsets, but specific ones that maybe look like surfaces or curves or other generalizations of this concept, which we will actually define later on in a few videos of what a manifold is. But before we do that, let's just make an impressionistic viewpoint and let's consider uh, a torus. So this is a surface um, which is often called a donut or a torus. And it's hollow, so we don't actually include the interior of this. So this is a surface that, um, for which we don't actually, when we slice it, all we have are these circles. Or, well, actually, we'll see in a moment what we what we have. Um, what are our cross sections of this uh, subset of R three? And imagine it's embedded in R three in such a way that, uh, let's say the axis is directly in the middle for simplicity and maybe it looks something like this right there's the third axis too so we have this torus in R3 and let's look at a very special function on this torus. And what this function is going to tell us is just going to tell us, if we pick a point here, what is the height of this point? We don't care about what its direction is or what its position is in the xy plane. So here's, by the way, is x, and here's y, and here's z. All we care about is uh, what's the height. So we project from this subset. call this function h, we just project from this subset to the real line, and it just reads us the height of the point that we're looking at. And let's focus a little bit on looking at images, looking at certain points in the image of this function. If we look at the inverse image, so we look at all the points that get mapped to a specific height. This traces out sort of a curve on this donut. So we take this slice, we, take, we can think of it as taking the xy plane, shifting it to this height, whatever this height is, and then slicing this torus, and we look at that cross section. And that cross section looks something like a circle. And what happens, and what we want to look at is, we want to look at how this surface decomposes as we change the height and we take these cross sections. So we'll notice that if we first, if we chose a point that wasn't even in the image, we would get the empty set as our inverse image. If we chose a point that was directly at the highest position, we would get a single point. And as soon as we move any amount down, we'll immediately start getting a, a circle. So let's go a little bit further, uh, and let's see what happens if we choose a point, let's say, over here. We look at the inverse image, and I take this slice. It might be hard to visualize from this picture, but we get sort of um, still something that looks more or less like a circle, but it wobbles a little bit. Maybe it looks something like that. And then let's go even further. Let's take yet another inverse image, this time at a very special point. It's at a point, you know, before we even do that, let's look at what happens if we take a point in the middle, just so I can have some anticipation so you can maybe guess what happens. If we take a point exactly in the mi middle at z equals 0, we'll slice this, and if you notice, this is where the whole of the donut appears. And what we'll get is we'll get a circle on one band and then a circle on another one of these bands. So the inverse image of zero is actually the union of two circles that are disjoint. So maybe now it might be better to guess at what happens at a point intermediary between these.
if we pull this back, what happens, what's sort of the transition point between having these two disjoint circles and having a circle that's sort of wobbling and it looks like it's um, pinching at some point? What we'll get is we'll get sort of something that looks like a figure eight. in that position. So it looks like two circles that came together and met at a single point. And we can keep doing this um, and we'll sort of look at our surface through these slices. So what's special about the difference between some of these um, subsets of the torus uh, is that very often what happens is, is that if we look at these um, slices, it looks sort of like they have a fixed dimension, and at every point near along one of these lines, it looks exactly like an ordinary curve. Even when we go to the second stage, this looks still like, like an ordinary curve, but as soon as we hit this particular point at which it looks like these two circles are coming together and they intersect exactly at one point, it no longer looks like um, as if it's just a single curve going through um, the point at which the intersection takes place. It sort of looks like there are two curves and they meet at something that looks like an X. Um, and such, a, such an object is, doesn't look locally like an ordinary line, um, but all of the other ones do. And so some of the observations we make from looking at this picture is that for a function such as the projection function, which is an example of a differentiable function, the inverse image of some of its points, in fact it looks like most of them, are actually lower dimensional sort of sub-manifolds. Whatever that means, it's something that looks like it has one fewer dimension and it looks like a line if I zoom in close enough, except for some very special points. But the important thing about these points is that there are very, very few of them. And later we'll prove a theorem that tells us that actually the set of points at which the subset, the inverse image of these points are not manifolds, has measure zero, which means you can almost never find it. Another way to think about what measure zero means is if you were to pick something at random, you would have probability zero of picking it if it had measure zero. So what we have here is, if I call this point, let's say I choose any one of these points and I call it C, we have a function H of X, Y, and Z, and Z actually happens to be C as well, so we can ignore this third component, and we get some value, some constant value C. And what we can also do is, we can look at this subset, now since we think of it as a function of just two variables, we can look at this subset of R2, the, that's the slice at which we cut this at, and we have a function of two variables, we can ignore this one, that equals some constant. And it would be nice if we can describe this curve, for instance, in terms of one of these variables. So if I had a curve that looked maybe something like this in the plane, and I knew that this was actually um, the pre-image of some function at a fixed point C, I might want to know if, if I plotted the xy plane here, if I could describe what this curve looks like in terms of one variable. So if I can write this as a function of y in terms of x, or x in terms of y, and when you could do that. Clearly you can't write this as, you, you can't write this entire function as uh, a single function of the variable x because, uh, for instance, it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Um, but what you can do is locally at any point here, you might be able to find a neighborhood in some domain and a function that describes this curve. And you can check, you know, locally around some fixed point, yes, it does make sense to talk about this function. It completely passes that vertical line test. And we can do this everywhere, at least for a function y of x, until we reach this corner over here. Not this corner, but this rightmost point. So as we reach this point, 
no domain on the x-axis will allow us to write this curve as a function of that variable. However, we can write it as a function of the other variable by simply tilting our heads and writing this position, finding some neighborhood here, and writing this curve as a function of y at this point. So we can sort of describe our curve by different functions restricting to different domains depending on certain conditions. And the question is, what exactly are these conditions? When can you do this? How general are these results? Do I, can I only do this for functions of two variables? What if I had 17 and I wanted to solve for, let's say, the first four in terms of the last 13? Can I do that? When can I do that? What are sufficient conditions that allow me to do that? And the implicit function theorem is going to exactly describe to us what these assumptions are.